Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Orthodox Nationalist. This is Matthew Raphael Johnson, and it is the 25th of August, 2021. And I've had uh, several requests to continue talking about Afghanistan. Many of you are aware that I've been dealing with this issue for a very long time. Um, very few places that where Johnson's law is so blatantly manifest, as in a very complex, very um, uh, really difficult part of the world that's known to very few. Um, the news media, as I've said a hundred times, has no interest in the truth of the matter. They aren't knowledgeable about the field. Um, if anything, they're embedded in what's left of the military organization and get everything from Amnesty International or the CIA or the State Department. Never, of course, going to the um, the Taliban, who is um, the legitimate uh, government of, of the country. I've been saying this for a very long time, and it's part of the uh, thesis of my book on uh, the American failures of um, in, in the Islamic world. The title is The Foreign Policy of Mass Society. If you remember um, last year, there was this rumor, uh, it was about a year ago, um, where the regime promoted this story that the Russians were paying Taliban to kill Americans. You know, we're at a point right now where there's not even an attempt to put out normal um, rational stories, even if they're completely false. There's almost a, a deliberate attempt to make them as absurd as possible. What the system likes to do, the media likes to do, is piggyback its favorite issues one on top of another. So in that make-believe raid on Osama's, uh, Bin Laden's compound in Pakistan, he was said to have books by William Pierce and David Duke. Um, you know, trying to, trying to pile as much, uh, of their enemies on top of one another as, as they can. Johnson's law is such that they could make up whatever they want. This is how the regime's media manufacture consent. Um, everything from, you know, weapons of mass destruction to, you know, chemical warfare. Um, Times uh, that I guess about a year ago, uh, the New York Times had had three of its main journalists just do what they normally do and rewrite a CIA press release by coming up with this ridiculous story, and that Trump, of course, was aware of it and deliberately did nothing. And this story came out at the beginning of the withdrawal process from Afghanistan. The Americans, of course, at the time, were completely bogged down, um, adding a Russian angle. Um, um, you know, gave credence to the anti-Russian nonsense and the attacks on Putin and the election and, and everything else. The Taliban hardly needed financial incentive to attack a hated foreign occupier. But this is the level of um, um, of debate that we that we deal with here, and um, it, it's 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 normal at this stage, uh, and this is this is what people are, are using um, in in their in their own discussions, because now this is front page news. Many of you are aware that I've said for, uh, you know, 15 years at least, that the Taliban are really the only hope for Afghanistan. Um, their whole agenda is to have a very strict form of moral reconstruction on a country that has had all of its family and clan and economic institutions destroyed by warfare. 
the two presidents, as I mentioned before, were trained in the United States. Ashraf Ghani is an American citizen, by the way. The guy has minimal ties with Afghanistan. He went to Lake Oswego High School in Oregon in the 60s. Um, the American Field Service sponsored this. And this is, you can find this in any biography. He went to the American University in, in Beirut and then on a government scholarship to Columbia um, and stayed there uh, through his doctoral degree. And he went to um, a university in, in Denmark. Uh, he taught at the University of California, Berkeley, and of course, the World Bank. This is the man who was installed in an election, as I've mentioned, where a tiny percentage of the country was able to vote, since for the most part, the Taliban forces and other anti-government forces um, control 80% of the, of, the, um, of the country. One of the main issues that hasn't come up here is the ethnic issue. There is a tremendous distrust, um, and I recommend, actually it's a few years old, but the Carnegie Endowment, of all people, uh, uh, Doran Soros, the Taliban's winning strategy in Afghanistan, an excellent analysis, this is, you know, 09, but it's definitely worthwhile. Uh, the Pashtun, um, not quite the majority. Have always felt themselves um, slighted, uh, especially in the north of the country, where they're a, a relatively small uh, minority. Um, and as they say, you know, the Afghan media, uh, controlled largely by the West, has expanded the scope of these ethnic conflicts. Um, in fact, those owned by non-Americans um, have done a lot to break down these these barriers. You have the Shiite forces, you have the Sunni Pashtuns, and um, going back to the to the 19th century, um, when they first were building this this modern state, um, the government since 2001 has largely been in control of non-Pashtun peoples, and of course they're to say the least uh, discriminated against as a result, and the Taliban have a huge presence there. And the alienation of these people is part of the reason that the um, their success, especially in the South, has been so significant. But they have overcome this. The Taliban is, has crossed over tribal lines, which was a um, nightmare for the regime. Um, you have Tartars, for example, who have sided with the Taliban. Even Uzbek, which, which is, was shocking um, have a, have a strong presence in the Taliban, even in the north. Um, but to be, being able to rally the uh, non Pashtun peoples is a, is a big deal. And, um, you know, the, the heavy Islami, um, organization in the north was very, very close to the Taliban these days. They, they, the organization, the Taliban organization is extremely flexible. And yet, um, of, of one purpose. The invasion, which of course had no basis in reality, um, created this tiny group of dependent, well-off, both foreigners and Afghans who are essentially foreigners. Um, in the book on um, the Taliban winning strategy, you have about maybe 15,000 uh, living in, in the capital city. Um, they have no real connection to the population. None of these, none of the elite politicians have any real connection to the people. But even in Kabul, in places like this, you know, most of the city is off limits to normal Afghans. This dependent elite has a, really is very well off. They pay no taxes. Um, and many of them are even, not even fully fluent in, in the main languages. The bureaucrats there are, are very poorly trained, and but they need these you know lower lower levels 
lower level Afghans to um, take care of the minor. It's like, you know, Palestinians in Saudi Arabia. And over the years, this foreign cult has become, you know, almost this inbred organization. The Afghan army uh, is not taken seriously. I've been talking about this for a very long time. They're made fun of by the Americans. They have no connection with the population. Drug use is out of control. Most of them simply hand their weapons over to the Taliban forces or an allied forces. Um, and the only thing that they really can rely on are their special forces units. And again, many of them are not even Afghan. They have been involved um, in massacres of so-called suspected Taliban, which could be any. 2008 was the big one. And you had at least rumors, which were believed immediately, about um, mass killings and, and uh, torture and everything else. Given the nature of the war, it was vaguely believable. And the Taliban have been able to you know, take this seriously and, and promote it. They have a very firm understanding of um, what we would call propaganda. A lot of people don't realize the nature of the Soviet-Afghan war and what really caused the, the failure of the Soviet army then. None of that was, just like the French in, in Vietnam, none of this was understood. None of this was taken seriously. And you simply don't um, have really any understanding. I've told you the story of the fake um, second-in-command of the Taliban that was involved in about a year ago in upper-level negotiations for weeks and weeks and weeks before someone found out that it, well, he was a fraud. They have no idea who they're dealing with here. I still can't believe it. The Soviets, one of the reasons the Soviets failed was a complete lack of any attempt to win over the citizens. Um, they never, they never um, thought to make any bridges with the Islamic population, whether Shiite or, or Sunni. And it's very similar. The, the Americans have not, have not done that either. You know, um, guerrilla tactics are extremely difficult. The Soviets always, you know, were trained in this, you know, large-scale confrontations. The guerrilla experience, guerrillas using hit-and-run tactics, it's very difficult for a regular army to deal with that. Um, and, of course, they had a single set strategy, as, as many people have noted. Um, so there was really no tactical um, uh, creativity there. You had these large-scale offenses against the um, Islamic groups. And they would, you know, clear a sector. They didn't make any distinction between the Mujahideen and the civilians because they, they didn't wear uniforms at the time of the Taliban do. Um, they would conquer an area, the Soviets would conquer an area, and then pull out. They, they couldn't stay. They didn't have the manpower to stay. I think at, at their height, they had about 100,000 men, uh, mostly conscripts, and then as now, a very poorly trained Afghan army, then as now, having minimal uh, contact with the with the population. Then as now, you have a miserable failure of intelligence. Um, they didn't really know what they were looking at. Aerial reconnaissance turned out to be faulty most of the time. Yes, yeah, special forces did pretty well. That was about it. Um, the whole notion of um, the the nationalist side of this was so foreign to the Soviets. They didn't have the ideological background um, to to make sense out of any of it. But 2008, 2010, you had you know indiscriminate bombings. Um, and the West simply said, well, they're, they're Taliban, they're drug dealers. They could be anybody. I've seen dozens of these videos issued by the army where they're attacking a Taliban stronghold and there's simply no, there's no evidence that that's what it is. It could be anything. Um, and Afghan media put these, some of these pictures of civilian deaths, um, on the air. 
Um, and you know, the Taliban had been fairly strict in their, in their tactics. They, the last thing they wanted to do was alienate the population since that was one of the main props in the whole Mujahideen movement, whether it be in Soviet era or, or now. They have absolutely no interest in alienating anybody. Except, of course, that foreign that bureaucratic uh, elite in, in sequestered in Kabul, who, of course, were rushing the, the airports not too long ago. Um, I know I've mentioned this in, in articles um, before, and I'll continue to mention it. You're talking about some of the most corrupt entities uh, in world politics is the American-imposed um, government, those two presidents and these, these bureaucrats who really have nothing to do uh, with the country. Um you know, even as, as early as 2010, the ANA, or the Afghan National Army, lost between 50 and 60,000 men. Um, the Americans have hidden their own casualty numbers. I know I've read, now this, this, their website, the, um, Islamic Emirate, or the Taliban's website has been taken down. Um, and I relied on that because they, it was, it was actually very interesting and very well written. Um, this was, um, was this last year, I guess, um, the Taliban themselves and, and wrote, and actually very good English, they said, some independent media outlets and international observers have reported that the Kabul regime under Ashraf Ghani has lost more than 25% of its force strength and continues to lose an average of 250 soldiers per week. One has to bear in mind that these are very conservative estimates because the regime has taken measures to hide the true, ca a true casualty toll due to the adverse effect it has on morale of its forces who are already stretched thin and living in dire condition. The total demoralization and the endless desertion of the ANA means that it doesn't, it never really functioned. That isn't the case with, for example, the ARVN, the South Vietnamese Army. That's a completely separate uh, issue. They were an effective force. Um, and I've dealt with that actually before on, on this show. The Taliban are disciplined and experienced. They have a very competent uh, core of commanders, many of whom cut their teeth in the, in the Soviet era. But the corruption, um, the total lack of any integrity here, especially with the aid money, which the entire country is dependent on, um, you have subcontractors and subcontractors private entities hiring other private entities who are in charge of dispersing this aid with no coordination. Some of this money is has gone into the elite, has gone into the presidency, and this new, again, dependent group of Afghan elites has become extremely wealthy and have made themselves very uh, hated. Um, uh, foreign money is considered some sort of a, a mark of, of distinction. Um, the regime exists entirely on foreign uh, subsidies. Uh, so this aid um, has enriched middlemen more than it has anybody else. Um, this is a, a 2009 from the, uh, the book on the Taliban winning strategy about the, uh, the former president, uh, Kazai. It says, chosen by the United States in 2001, Mainly because of his closeness to the Bush administration, President Karzai lacked a political base and tried to eliminate local powers who potentially could threaten his control of the periphery. He relied on a narrow coterie to fill important positions in his administration and nominated governors who were politically allied with him. Because of Karzai's poor choices, based more on personal relations than confidence, this strategy backfired. The elimination or weakening of local leaders produced even further political fragmentation. They could rely on absolutely nobody. Nothing has changed even from the Soviet era. Um, they note that the local strongmen are not really different from the commanders of, of the 80s, and their resources come from outside the country. 
And these are the people who uh, charge uh, customs tolls for the most part, a lot of illegal commerce. And none of this, of course, none of this money is ever used for actual state building. And these are the people who end up getting the so-called aid money. Um, you know, you had a disarmament program, they note, in 2003-2004. Um, the U.S. was paying, can you imagine, paying these people to hand over their weapons. And all it really meant was that um, um, it just it allowed these guys to upgrade their arsenals. They handed in old weapons, got the money for it, and then got new ones. Um, even as early as 2007, everyone knew that the government was going to fall the minute the U.S. pulled out. There was no support of the war locally and certainly not in the United States. Um, and when they noticed that local groups were buying large uh, cash of weapons, especially in the South, um, and, um, you know, these weapons became very easy to find. You don't have district-level institutions. You never did. Um, what exists are these foreign enclaves, to say the least, completely inbred, completely inefficient. Um, their members are transferred from one place to another. Everything is based on personal connections. And you have nothing but a, a you know, the security apparatus is minimal. One of the keys to the Taliban victory is their building of an alternative and parallel administration. That was actually very uh, well organized. It was legitimately popular. They didn't live ostentatiously. That sort of thing was banned in Taliban ideology. Um, and for the official structures, there simply the security did not exist. Police and judges were not taken seriously and were simply incompetent. Um, they weren't building institutions. These were personal. Um, these were personal institutions, and and Taliban, of course, were doing just the opposite. You know, the judgeships, for example, um, almost didn't exist. Um, there was one province, they note, that you have a, uh, a Kunduz province. You have a province of a million people that's policed by about 750 men. More, more maybe like 500. So what they end up doing is they go to the Sharia courts. And the Taliban courts are considered objective, and they are taken seriously. Um, but, you know, even, even these so-called reform programs are usually imposed by foreigners and foreigners, um, that are subcontractors of subcontractors with no, uh, no corresponding responsibility. The ANA can't function. I mean, the Americans were saying that 10 years ago that they can't feel the force of more than a hundred people, um, led autonomously. And, you know, and, and these, these organizations, when, 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 um, one group may attack, they simply don't even intervene. They don't have that ability. They simply don't have the ability to, to fight back. Um, nor do they have any desire. They know that they're going to lose. They've known that for a long time. So why are they going to risk it? Um, so, you have the the um, the strategy of the Taliban insurgency over the last ten years is to continue the delegitimization of the Afghan so-called Afghan administration to isolate these people who are already extremely isolated, and it's very similar. The um, the foreigners um, are similar to what the Soviets were in the 1980s. They're isolated. They don't have any social support. They have no acceptance of the local population. They have no understanding of the local population, which, of course, is the exact opposite for Taliban forces. Um, there was really no contact, the administration and the local population. The Taliban did the exact opposite. They weren't just like Hamas or Hezbollah. They're not just a political party or a military force. They're a social institution. Um, this is... Um, and ultimately, you know, the U.S. Army took over some security, but they had so few men that they simply couldn't do it, and you had no um, incentive to to stick their neck out here. 
um, it got to the point, even, even 10 years ago, it got to the point where uh, administrators couldn't travel from one place to another. Um, the Taliban weren't really capturing districts and urban areas. They simply surrounded it and isolated it. No one was going to defend these local um, drug-addicted policemen or these soldiers. Many of them kicked out of their village for um, for uh, bad behavior. This has come up, and uh, American soldiers have been saying this for a long time. This is the worst group of people you could possibly build a, a military force from. Um, but even, you know, like the Carnegie Institute, they fully admit you had all over the eighty percent of the country up until, you know, the final fall of the government, um, local people are turning to Taliban courts. They're seen as effective, they're seen as fair, and of course the the official system is seen as irredeemable. Wherever the Taliban went, crime decreased. The criminal gangs were destroyed. Heroin was stopped with extreme violence. And as I've said in uh, last week with Sven on the um, uh, Daily Nationalist, the Chai Boys, or the whole, this uh, pagan um, boy rape, that's a part of rural, rural, rural areas, at least after the war, um, where morality had collapsed and the family had collapsed. Um, these people were, people controlling this, uh, usually local local elites, were shot. And shot in public. Taliban were uh, given what their name is, you know, their students, they were considered fairly well educated. And because religion was their main concern, not tribal loyalty, and this was actual policy, that they were considered to be objective. They were above these factional fights, the, the um, revenge killing that's so common in these um, uh, tribal societies. And you know, they, they charged what's called harvest taxes. And these were visibly spent on local needs. So they actually did um, not only really consolidate their power in these areas, but, um, you know, we're, we're living modestly. And you can actually see these taxes being spent where it's supposed to go. And, you know, their strategy, and part of all this, of course, is targeting those who work for farmers. This is a violent um, colonial force. These guys are fair game. You had a huge number of casualties from this, but it was very, very dangerous to work for these people. And very frankly, you would want to work for these people. It meant that there's something wrong with you. You have to be so alienated and so hated in your own country to work with those who were literally destroying you. They had spies all over the place. The Taliban did. Um, to the point where no one was safe. The wars with the Soviet and the present one began to weaken the tribal system. Uh, the postulants, I guess, have the strictest uh, tribal identity, which is, you know, as they say, very flexible. Um, and these, you know, kind of vague ideologies, which aren't really institutionalized, um, these have been uh, broken down. Some people may use tribal identity to build a, a patronage network. But these institutions almost don't exist. Eastern provinces, maybe. Um, the Carnegie Institute book makes the point that after 2001, the army attempted to use these smaller tribes to mobilize them against the Taliban, and it was completely a miserable failure. And huge amounts of money wasted. Um, especially when the subsidies were going to poppies. Drugs, of course, is one of the other things that broke down these tribal loyalties, meaning that when you have a trans-tribal identity, and the Taliban have been the only ones that have been able to build that, they were building ties even amongst um, tribes that hated each other. Uh, any elder that was opposing them was seen as, as perpetuating these battles, the revenge uh, back and forth of these smaller tribes in the country, not just in the South either. Um, and of course, um, the more energetic of these people end up joining the Taliban movement. They are genuinely popular for all these reasons. Um, and the regime was saying for a long time that 
you know, the North was not a Taliban stronghold, but that was very, very misleading. And it's something that you know no one's really, um, no one certainly is is not talking about. It's talking about anywhere. The Iranians, uh, Russians, uh, Russian media has been talking about this recently, um, and how extremely important this connection is. For a long time, Iran opposed the Taliban movement for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, in fact, they were um, almost impossible to reconcile. One of the things that brought the Taliban and Iran together was the creation of the American proxy army of ISIS. Uh, the Taliban are bitter enemies of the ISIS, uh, Western ISIS movement, and as are, of course, the Iranians, and they all are well aware that this is an American intelligence organization or an Israeli intelligence organization. Um, when it was 2016, the Taliban leader uh, Mansour, Akhtar Mansour, was killed in a drone strike from the Americans. He was one of the people negotiating an alliance um, with the Taliban, um, with the Iranians. And he was uh, leaving, he was in Iran, he was leading to, to Pakistan, for Pakistan. And you had tremendous outrage. And Iranian politicians were absolutely losing it. Now, two groups that were enemies now became very quick friends. And it was the end of 2018. This is in Tass articles a few days ago. In 2018, um, they were hosting envoys and they not recognized the Taliban system. The Iranians, you know, um, realize, of course, there is no extraterritorial drives for the Taliban. They're struggling to maintain um, their hold of, of the country, let alone anything beyond it. But I'm pretty sure there's some neocons out there talking about wanting to take over the world. Um, and what everyone forgets about, of course, and one of the central issues is drug trafficking. Iran, for all of its, you know, first world um, growth, is unfortunately one of the most drug-addicted countries on the planet. This was weaponized opium from the American-held sections, northern sections in Afghanistan, deliberately targeting Iran. So when the Taliban, um, well, many years ago, began destroying this crop, bringing it down to nothing, just prior to the American invasion, that was the very beginning of an alliance building between two former enemies, it took a little while to manifest itself, but it, 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 that's when it began. Um, when the Taliban banned all production of, of opium, and I mentioned the UN has given them all kinds of rewards and everything else, um, you know, you had the big sections like um, uh, Nangahar and, and Helmand, these, these provinces that were the center of it, been reduced to zero. Uh, the Taliban never used drugs to finance their activities. There was a fatwa against it, and it was it was punishable by death. The Iranians, of course, don't forget, host a huge number of um, Afghan refugees. Very few countries actually are as open to refugees as the Iranians. This also is a security problem. So the refugees, and then with possible drug smugglers, you had a, a crisis. Um... So these American fronts, you know, Al-Qaeda, the ISIS, they're seen as American fronts. They only attack um, the Taliban and the Iranians. This was one of the big miscalculations of the American-Israeli combine because it brought these two uh, countries together. Iran is a wealthy country. Um, but, you know, they, they, have, they have, these refugees have fled to Iran. And when the Iranians started dealing with unemployment and sanctions, you had low-wage, often illegals, flooding in over over the border and doing you know low-level job. Um, but the refugees have gone up you know three hundred percent in um, uh, just since just in the last few years. But the Iranians are well aware that there is really one hope for that country. Um, and the financing that's assisted, uh, the assistance, I should say, coming from Iran has put them over the edge. You know, so you have Pakistan, 
and Iran um, supporting them. Um, so many of these movements from Al-Qaeda and um, technically the Taliban is banned in Russia. But as far as Afghanistan is concerned, they're seen as, as someone to, to take very seriously. They can create this unified power in Afghanistan. Given the fact that they have crossed over tribal boundaries, um, they can't be talking about, and they do not talk about any kind of intertribal warfare. Their whole concern with consolidation has led to a shift in their mentality, a shift in their ideology, such that um, um, they have, you know, they're they're far more open. It's not just a Pashtun group like it used to be. Their agenda, and again, this also comes from the from the Russian press. Um, I don't know if this is mentioned in, I'm sure it's not mentioned in the American press, but they have their agenda laid out. I've been talking about this for a long time. Their new policies. You know, going from a, it's difficult to go from a, a guerrilla, uh, battle hardened, uh, military machine to a government. That's an extremely difficult transition to make. But because of this pretty substantial unity and the fact that these are Spartan, these are Spartan men. They're not, they're not living ostentatiously. Um, now that they've taken over the country, they've made it very clear that they don't have an interest and attacking anyone except those who worked for the formal government, and even former government, even there, there's talk of, of amnesty. Well, they've come to power, and they've laid it out, and this is what they, they've consistently maintained. Nationalism, of course, is at the absolute center of everything that they do. Um, the irony, of course, is that the Americans talk about this nonsense about Afghanistan being a safe haven for terrorism, and these very terrorist groups are the creations of the U.S. sent into the country to attack Taliban forces. They, you know, the, the, the women issue is laughable. You have a country that literally doesn't have an economy where good jobs are extremely hard to find. Um, a country that the, the economy, to the extent it existed at all, was based entirely on aid money. And they're concerned with women getting white-collar jobs. This is their big concern. No one can get those kind of jobs there. Foreigners had, um, uh, foreigners had monopolized them. How is this even an issue? A few days before the consolidation, and this is this is something that I don't know if you read this. The feminist um, demonstration, you know, with English language signs. In the capital city, of course, this demonstration was solely for the cameras, financed by the Americans, of course. I mean, they are the colonial um, power there. Um, and done in those areas, of course, that no one is allowed, allowed to go to. Most of Kabul, you know, up until recently, was, as I said, off limits to foreigners. This was their own um, compound. So the press... Um, who was actually a part of the mobilization of this, takes pictures of this this group of foreign women um, demanding access to jobs and access to education, despite the fact that men aren't being educated, given the nature of the warfare. And, of course, the Taliban's central, central essence, the, the word itself, means students and education. Of course, they're not opposed to female education, so long as it's not... Um, their, their main thing is that it's not... Um, now, we all know that this is very intelligent, um, that the genders aren't mixed. What a disaster that's been in, in Western education. Um, and But when you have a non-functional economy, you talk about these, these foreign dependent entities in, in, in the sequestered parts of the big cities. You know, women play a substantial role. Most of them aren't really Afghan. Or if they are, they are educated in America. Those are the people who are, you know, worried about what may happen to them. And of course, overwhelmingly, um, Afghan women have been treated poorly by the government, by the American, by everybody. Because that's what happens when a country is torn apart by war. The whole essence of the Taliban, well, I, I taught um, a class on the, on, the, um, on the Islamic world at uh, Mount St. Mary's um, many years ago, university. 
And I got into a lot of trouble for defending the Taliban's uh, gender policy there. Not only because the family is the central issue in this reconstruction, it has to be. And having a strong maternal figure is absolutely at the center of that, not only uh, as a mother, but also as an educator. The transmission belt of, of tradition, that what was, that's what was broken given these decades of warfare. And these, these liberal uh, uh, foreign women in Kabul wearing uh, Islamic garb with a sign in English saying, I want to go to school or something like that, um, are so bizarrely out of touch. They're rebuilding their families, trying to develop some kind of normality, and they're worried about going to a university. It's completely out of touch. You know, what we call first world problems here. The American press had a privileged position in Afghanistan under the colonial regime. They're terrified that they're not going to be able to function there anymore. They believe in a private press, but one that does not engage in mindless uh, uh, sensationalism, which the press is known for, bias, and, and anything that's at war with this reconstruction. You can't institute divisions. Islam is popular. More than that, it's the only real foundation for unification. You may have seen some of the Protestant groups. The Taliban are killing Christians for no reason. I have the feeling what they're referring to is um, punishments of the foreigners. But they do this all the time. They do it in China, they do it in Russia, they do it in Belarus. It's the same group of people. These foreigners, these, um, um, you know, Pentecostals, many of them are CIA spreading these rumors. Which is something that, by the way, ISIS was doing. And we know that the whole point of that was, you know, this, the Jewish foundation of ISIS, destroying these small, you know, ancient institutions of, of you know, Nestorians, whatever, in that part of the world. They were doing that. Um, you know, groups that Muslims never even noticed before, all of a sudden have to be burnt out of their, of their monastery. The Protestant fundamentalists will always follow the CIA, the military intelligence line, and, you know, invent these, invent these stories. Their main concern is the consolidation internally of the country. The banning of usury, and I mentioned this with Sven last week, um, concerning the banking system. Rebuilding and re almost recreating um, the banking system, the Havala system. Um, but you know the ISIS connection, you know, as, as I mentioned, has to be uh, has to be understood. Um, you know, um, and it's a shame that their website doesn't uh, is no longer functioning. I can't find anything of theirs um, online at all. Um, but the other thing, you know, in 2019, the Moscow Peace Conference, their delegation made, made it very clear what they're, what they're talking about. They need consensus for rebuilding. They can't have dictatorial control because it would mean the destruction of their movement. They have to take um, the other groups into consideration. They have no choice, including the Shiites, especially since I have an Iranian ally now. Um, here's what the Emirates said. Um, actually, in that uh, the 2019 uh, Moscow conference, Taliban said the current constitution of the Kabul administration is not reliable because it has been copied from the West and has been imposed on Afghanistan's Muslim society under the shadow of occupation. It can neither respond to the desires of the Afghans nor can it be implemented, as its provisions are vague and contradictory with each other. It's constantly being violated by the high-ranking officials of the Kabul administration. Rather, the current administration itself is contrary to the Constitution. So the Constitution as such, in its present version, is a major obstacle to peace. And they're certainly correct here. 2004, um, the Constitution that was forced to them, claimed to be officially Islamic, but it also says that they're going to adhere to the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Meaning, 
it completely undermines any Islamic identity. It's supposed to be now a secular, liberal country. One of the first things it says is now the central bank is independent of the state, which means it's the property of Western financiers. Um, you know, um, and, and as far as the civilians are concerned, the Emirate has also said they've been postponing military operations throughout this war so as not to risk civilian casualties. But they say the Americans and their friends carry out night raids on civilian homes, make blind bombardments, and use heavy weapons in civilian places. They arrest people from the cities on the basis of suspicion and kill them under punishment of torture. Now with the new American policy, bombardment and night raids have further increased, which in turn have increased the graph of civilian casualties too. Albeit most of the media do not publish these reports, and these incidents remain unregistered. They're seeking popular support. Of course, they're going to talk about this kind of thing. They have nothing to gain from civilian death. They would have everything to lose here. The outgoing government, as corrupt and evil it is, they have every reason to start shooting. Because who knows what's going to happen to them if they get captured by the, by the non-foreign population. Um, they make it clear and this is another quote from the Taliban from a a while ago, last year, I guess it is. Meanwhile, the political tension and squabbling inside the Kabul regime has pushed crisis to a new level. The resignation of of Ghani's national security advisor, Hanif Atmar, followed by the resignation letters of the Minister of Interior, Minister of Defense, and Chief of Intelligence, has exposed the deep schisms uh, gripping the Kabul-based administration, speeding up the drivers behind imminent collapse. Um, the previous month saw a decision by American forces in compliance with their stooges to pull out uh, its forces from all rural areas of Afghanistan and focusing instead on strengthening the defenses of major cities in order to control the record number of casualties. Um, but even there, there, there's also talk about two of the ANA commanders, uh, Karwan and General um, uh, Wardak. Uh, two pilots also were killed inside the Kabul. You know, the, the Taliban were, had penetrated that sequestered area even a few years ago. Even those security measures have failed. And you have, you know, these pundits, these idiots talking about how we had no idea that the ANA was going to collapse here. You know, last year, rather than simply pull their forces out, the U.S. simply would not re-up them. The tour was up. They wouldn't. They wouldn't. Uh, they wouldn't re-up them there. And they're well aware. You know, on YouTube, you have all of these testimonies. Soldiers, the defections to the Taliban are everywhere. That's ultimately how the um, Taliban movement won. It was very easy for them over the last ten years to destabilize. A non-existent administration, um, and you know the the, the road system. I've I've dealt with that before, the so-called Ring Road, which was a way to move the army uh, more quickly, American soldiers more quickly, and um, of course it's insecure. They simply don't have the men to defend it. Um, you know because they failed to deal with the propaganda side of things. They can't develop a security force for any of these infrastructural projects. They simply can't do it. They don't have that that capacity. As of now. And of course now, of course, it's, it's over. And I've been talking about this for such a long time. Um, and this is, this is absolutely, um, absolutely central. They, they built their message, a simple Islamic point of view, and the corruption of the colonial regime. There's no way they could lose with that. The battle is against infidel invaders, or British, Soviet, American, whoever. They're a great, uh, very powerful rural and agrarian force. The hatred of the cities has just increased, given what the cities are now in Afghan life. This is why the so-called elections of these presidents are absurd. 
Obviously, members of the insurgency cannot vote. Most of the country is not under their control. And these ballots all took place just in the cities and in a few small areas of the cities. In the Pashtun movement alone, is you know like forty five percent of the population has long since been uh, alienated from, um, um, you know from from not just the administration but of course the Americans. The people who are crowding the airports now are those who cannot live under the Taliban force. But the Taliban simply can't function unless they create this consensus government, which has been their um, their uh, their official point of view for a very long time. Um, the Taliban's own website, though, has been clear about the military operation up until now. Um, it was last, last May 30th, of um, 20, two military vehicles carrying five Daesh fighters, ISIS fighters, with very sophisticated American weapons, and they were wearing special forces fatigues, were spotted both by the Emirate as well as government agents. They disembarked and got into two American vehicles. Um, and I meant to told this story before. They passed through dozens of checkpoints. Um, and... Um, um, entered into the interior ministry and shot the place up. Now, what happened here, you know, ISIS took responsibility for this attack through its own media agency, but that's hardly evidence. Um, and the attackers eventually were all, were all killed. Chances are, that story isn't even true. This was um, their own attempt at destabilization. I mean, it's laughable that ISIS had several large training centers in Kabul under the watchful eye of both the regime and the U.S. The U.S. sent ISIS against the Taliban in uh, Jalalabad, where they were defeated badly. So wherever there's a war between the Mujahideen in Afghanistan and Daesh, ISIS, foreign and government forces bomb the Taliban positions and attack them in a bid to aid ISIS. Story I mentioned you know, the Taliban forces seize American vehicles full of ammunition and equipment bound for ISIS positions. Um, and the surrendered personnel there confess fully that the Kabul regime and the U.S. have supported them and saved them from Taliban um, attacks, especially in their, you know, their, as they were defeated all over the place. Last year, the invaders, um, uh, the American invaders, uh, protected and rescued 250 ISIS personnel in Darzab district. Um, that were under a very withering attack from the Taliban. And this has been admitted by Kabul officials too. Um, and much of what the Americans were doing was um, protecting the ISIS movement, blatantly providing weapons and ammunition, and exaggerate its numbers. Just like in Syria, any attack from the Taliban on ISIS is harshly condemned um, by Washington. In 2019, January 13th, the U.S. organized a prison break for the ISIS at a Taliban prison in northwest Afghanistan. Once this happened, the USAF bombed the Taliban positions around the prison and sent special forces via helicopter to rescue 40 or so of the prisoners that were within it. There is a video, and I have it in an article. I have um, um, a hyperlink of it. It exists to the transfer of the Daesh fighters to the Afghan government. In the fighting in Western Afghanistan about a year ago between ISIS and the Taliban, the U.S. without fair fail attacked the Taliban positions. And, and again, the exact same thing occurred in Syria. Um, and again, the same thing happened in Syria all the time. There's blatant interventions to protect them from, um, from the Taliban on one side or the Syrian army on the other. Um, and this couldn't be any clearer here. So I mentioned the um, the incident on May 30th where ISIS had penetrated a um, a um, A and A compound. It's one of the more interesting stories. And this was, you know, both the the um, um, both government agents and the Emirate were were watching it. 
They passed through these checkpoints, and CNN tried to make it make it like there was this big firefight. That they blew up the gates and fought their way in. But no eyewitness saw that, and the videotape doesn't show that. There'd be no way to gain access to the ministry without inside contact. CNN simply repeated what the embedded journalists had, had said. The very fact that ISIS has training centers right there in Kabul. I mean, you can't get you can't get any more blatant than that. Now something must have happened where um, the ANA was uh, was attacked by this ISIS force, assuming that's who it was. CNN automatically covered for them by saying, "Oh, this was a big firefight. Something happened." The point is. ISIS could never have penetrated these checkpoints without the slightest problem unless they were connected with the um, um, with the ANA themselves. And part of the reason the U.S. wants to keep a tiny group of men in the country is to allow a tripwire. You know, they could take one of their ISIS friends and have them shoot an American officer. And they're, they're allowed to, to then come back and, and begin. They're already carpet bombing parts of the country now. A few hundred men will be a sitting duck. That would be an awful job. And with all this information, of course, the American press will continue, because they're, they're embedded anyway, um, will continue to make believe that ISIS and the Taliban are somehow allies. I could go through story after story of the American support um, um, of that of that movement. Um, this is simply, um, and as I mentioned before, and this is difficult to talk about, but one of the reasons that this movement, uh, the government, collapsed, was the uh, Bata Bazi or the Chai Boys. Um, British and American Marines, and I have the um, citations for this too, child molestation is endemic in the Afghan National Army. Now, they shoot child molesters and drug dealers while the ANA welcome them, and the U.S. is supposed to tolerate them, even though they don't want to. Death penalty, of course. Is, um, there uh, is a police chief um, in Sangin, uh defends this practice all the time. This is normal. And of course, the ANA do absolutely nothing about it. This is one of the reasons the Taliban was able to take over so quickly. Uh, the Guardian UK did report on foreign military contractors engaging in this trade. Um, and this came out in, in WikiLeaks, and I have the citation for that as well. This is why they're packing the airports. Um, but not only did the American military know about this? But the media knew about this. Again, the Taliban is extremely well-organized and well-armed, partially because of the collapse of the ANA. You have these so-called experts saying how incredible it is that they can't believe the government collapsed so poorly. And the Republicans are trying to blame Joe Biden he had nothing to do with Afghan policy. He doesn't know where he is. He certainly supported it. But using this for for uh, partisan gain is laughable. Always made the point that their GDP growth figures under the, that government come exclusively from trade on American military bases. Aid is actually counted as growth. No one's going to invest in Afghanistan right now. Um, the U.S. government agency, which is privatized, SIGAR, that oversees the reconstruction of the country, made this statement. The U.S. government greatly overestimated its ability to build and reform government institutions in Afghanistan. That's the epitaph here. That's yet another failed American military adventure overseas. The American military was talking about their victories, the Taliban can't win, and their own publications were saying just the opposite. General Lloyd Lord Austin a few years ago said, Afghan ANA special forces are becoming the best in the region, which is considered a joke at the time. 
The U.S. is a failed empire, a picture of failure in this part of the world. Taliban have increased in popularity. They're massively popular in that country. Strict Islam, I'm with you, I'm no friend of Islam. But it's desperately needed. Any religious institution is needed to rebuild a war-torn country where morality has completely collapsed. The U.S. cares only to protect Israel and maintain the flow of the natural resources under American control, which are substantial, especially in the mining world. The Taliban, to a great extent, are a national socialist force. Their agenda is the reconstruction of this country in consensus with the other Islamic groups. They demand that the money that they use be raised in Afghanistan and from Afghanis. They rebuilt that country with practically no help from anyone before, of course, the 2001 invasion. They defeated the U.S. forces and ISIS mercenaries while making a mockery of the puppet government there. And the victory of the Taliban means a massive disruption in the supply of morphine and other opiates. Keep in mind, it's only a small percentage of the poppy crop that actually goes into you know, pain pills, allegedly so-called legitimate pain pills. The overwhelming majority are going to illegal uh, funds. This is a huge reason why the regime is going crazy and the Taliban has taken over. Victory for the Taliban is a victory for nationalism, is a victory for nat- natural law, is a victory for the good guys. Thank you, everyone, for listening. I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.